Thanks for tuning in to this finale of Debunking Kevin O'Leary. At the end of part two, we were using O'Leary's spokesperson role with his wine label as a comic precursor to the far more serious recent developments involving Kevin O'Leary. It's time to dig into his role as the paid brand ambassador for the now bankrupt FTX. The intricacies of this massive FTX crypto fraud are going to take years to unravel in the courts, so please don't expect a full rendering of the situation here and now because it continues to evolve. Here's what we knew for sure at the time of production. To begin with, based on his past declarations, O'Leary should have been an unlikely first choice as a paid spokesperson for any aspect of the crypto industry. As late as 2019, Kevin O'Leary was announcing during televised appearances that crypto was garbage, a digital game. No different than when I go to Las Vegas and put my money on black or red on a roulette wheel because where is the intrinsic value inherent in deploying real capital, let's talk real mm -hmm. money here, and putting it into Bitcoin as a storage of value. When people actually put real money into this, they make no interest, they can't pay their taxes with it, the regulators don't like it, which is always a problem for compliance. You haven't changed my mind at all. It's still <laughs> garbage, and I'm not going to take real money and put it into this thing. It's never going to happen. But now we know while he was making these derogatory statements, he had already been invested in various crypto coins for several years, Bitcoin and Ethereum among them. That makes him a total hypocrite, and he's currently getting called out for his hypocrisy by his television colleagues. You went from Charlie Munger's view on Bitcoin to Michael Saylor's view on Bitcoin. And I actually kidded you about it. I said, did that conversion coincide with the 15 million that you got from, from FTX? No, I was investing three and a half years earlier than that. I changed my mind back at early 2018 when I saw the regulators in jurisdictions like Canada, Switzerland, and Abu Dhabi start to change their minds. You just said you made this conversion in what year? I think it was 2018 I started investing, yeah. Just for, as a point of fact, for what it's worth, uh, May 14th, 2019, uh, you came on television and called Bitcoin garbage. When O'Leary jumped the crypto fence, he said at the time that as the world changes, he changes with it. But fact is, he invested in something he knew regulators didn't approve of. Kevin, uh, welcome back to the show. I barely recognize you with the laser eyes. What changed? <laughs> You know, I, it's not the first time that that uh, clip has been played back to me, I must say, <laughs> prior to that. I mean, I remember in 2017, I'm disclosing now, I bought Bitcoin and Ether back then. I kept quiet about it. Uh, regulators, particularly here stateside, were not on board, and they're still not yet. But obviously, the tone of this asset class is changing. His hypocrisy in this arena was to keep his own ass safe in the event that regulators started to look at him. But when O'Leary publicly swapped over, he really dove into the deep end. Some reports have O'Leary stating that 20% of his $400 million net worth is wrapped up in various aspects of the crypto market. I have millions of dollars. 20% okay. of my portfolio is now in cryptocurrencies wow. and blockchain. Hey. That's $80 million if both of those figures are accurate. Of course, one of his investments in a crypto arena was through FTX. And now we're into the meat of it. In August of 2021, O'Leary and FTX issued a joint press release announcing O'Leary's long-term investment in FTX and his new brand ambassador role in the company, a relationship that would provide O'Leary with a $15 million paycheck, which he insisted was to be paid in crypto. O'Leary also jumped on board with a Canadian company called WonderFi, a different brand new crypto platform that just a month prior was called Ostpro Energy Corporation which was nothing more than a 30-year-old alternative energy holding company P.O. Box on Granville Street in Vancouver, B.C., with shares that traded at half a cent per share in 2017. This same address was shared by such prestigious and notable trading legends as Accru Inc., Rio Silver Incorporated, and Nutrisci, which is listed as an ROE leader, whatever that means looking at this chart. According to Bar Chart, on December 17th of 2020, despite losing $154,000 that year, Ostpro's stock was somehow now trading at 25 cents per share, which on 14,838,000 shares outstanding gave it a market cap of $3.7 million, instead of the $74,190 evaluation it enjoyed just three years prior. Eight months later, the newly named WonderFi was moved from the TSX Venture Exchange, the pink sheets of the TSX, to the NEO Exchange, after obtaining a $5,584,155 non-brokered private placement at a price of $1.05 per share, which was four times the previous share price. This private placement was led by 
Sam Bankman-Fried through Alameda Research. O'Leary hit the news circuit about the backing of this company, where he is listed as a strategic investor. Vancouver-based WonderFi, trading under the TSX ticker WNDR, then went on to acquire Toronto-based BitBuy, formerly Instabit, another Canadian crypto platform, and they somehow paid $206 million in cash and stock for it. With 400,000 users on the platform at the time, that was a per-user price tag of $515 per head. Then on April 17th of 2022, the former shell company paid $38.5 million in an all-stock deal for another Canadian crypto exchange called Coinberry, consolidating Canada's crypto exchanges a little further. In typical O'Leary fashion, WonderFi stock on the day their BitBuy acquisition was announced closed at 247. When the acquisition of Coinberry closed in April, WNDR was trading at a buck 20. Today it trades at 16 cents. Everything this guy touches just seems to wither and die. Like fucking King Midas in reverse here, everything I touch turns to shit. Accordingly, the $5.6 million Alameda investment made by the genius Bankman Freed in WonderFi would now only be worth around $800,000 as their price per share dropped from $105 to $0.16. Cents. And the $38.5 million in stock accepted by Coinberry shareholders would now only be worth around $5 million and change, an 87% loss in 7 months. So if you're on any of these platforms in Canada, considering their links to FTX, might we suggest finding somewhere else to do your trades? Let's break out the timeline of FTX announcements starting from November 11th of 2022. FTX submitted Chapter 11 filings across the spectrum of FTX and Alameda. Here's what that organizational chart looks like. This diagram should have been investors' first clue. Normal companies don't look like this. So when you're wondering why it's taking lawmakers so long to unravel what the hell happened here, keep this diagram in mind. On that day, Sam Bankman-Fried, the CEO at FTX and 90% owner of Alameda, resigned and hightailed it to the Bahamas with his mommy and daddy. He stayed at his $40 million penthouse there until he was arrested on the 12th of December, the same day we released part one of this series, as it turned out. The CEO at Alameda, Caroline Allison, also went MIA, likely owing to the fact that her Alameda had been stealing billions of dollars from customer accounts at FTX.com and FTXUS, so that this 28-year-old senior trader with 18 months experience trading and a harem fetish could conduct crypto trades and engage in margin trading. The problem was she obviously sucked at it and apparently blew every penny on bad trades and investments like WonderFi. But looking at statements made during her interviews, is it any surprise that was the outcome? Do you think that you have been able to pull this thing off without your mathematics degree or? Yeah, absolutely could pull it off without my math degree. <laughs> Use very little math. Yeah, we don't really do any uh, technical analysis. Yeah, mostly we think of ourselves as a, a liquidity provider. So. Yeah, yeah, we do uh, some discretionary trading as well. And we do trading where uh, we can't always hedge our exposure. I think we kind of tend to hedge our exposure by default and there are a lot of people who are like very smart but aren't good at necessarily the very like messy world of trading especially crypto trading i think we we tend not to have things like stop losses i think those aren't necessarily a great risk management tool yeah i'm trying to think of a good example of a trade where i've lost a ton of money um well, I don't know. I probably don't want to go into specifics too much yeah, with that. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, yeah, I definitely keep the same thing. I mean, I think I've partly just gotten fairly lucky. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't think uh, if I went back and chose a different random path, it would have worked out this well. So, <laughs> As it turns out, SBF's so-called crypto empire was pretty much run out of this penthouse by this little dipshit and nine other roommates when they weren't engaged in drug field orgies that also made the news. Now, despite knowing these news reports, despite FTX going into bankruptcy, despite Bankman Fried fleeing the country, despite Ellison going into hiding in New York, on November 16th, O'Leary was declaring in interviews that SBF was a brilliant trader and 1% genius that he would invest in again. If SBF knocked on your door again and said, look, I failed in my last venture, uh, I have a new crypto venture, I need money, would you back him? You, you can love him or hate him given what's happened, but he was one of the most brilliant traders in the crypto universe. Would you back him? The answer would be yes. Other people would certainly disagree with O'Leary's assessment of this slop. 
Meet John Ray III, a renowned lawyer and insolvency professional. He accepted the CEO position at FTX after SBF abandoned ship to guide the company through its bankruptcy and reorganization. He is the same man that guided Enron after those founders sank the ship. He had nothing to do with the company prior to its collapse, but he has agreed to inherit the shitstorm at FTX to try and recover as much as he can for investors and creditors of the unregulated crypto exchange. To do that, he's broken his organizational chart down into four silos, and he calls them FTX US for domestic customers, FTX.com for international customers, Alameda Research, and an investment silo or hedge fund. Keeping in mind that Kevin O'Leary announced publicly that he would invest in Sam Bankman-Fried again, that Sam is a 1% genius, and that he was a brilliant trader, here's what the man who has to deal with the aftermath of FTX has to say about the company, how it was run, and who is responsible for its downfall. The following are highlights from Ray's testimony in front of Congress on December 13th of 2022. The clips have been trimmed down and had gaps removed, but if you'd like to see the full four-hour interview, it's on YouTube on the Wall Street Journal channel. The FTX group's collapse appears to stem from absolute concentration of control in the hands of a small group of grossly inexperienced, unsophisticated individuals who failed to implement virtually any of the systems or controls that are necessary for a company entrusted with other people's money or assets. Some of the unacceptable management practices Computer infrastructure that gave individuals and senior management access to systems that stored customer assets without security controls to prevent them from redirecting those assets. The storing of certain private keys to access hundreds of millions of dollars in crypto assets without effective security controls or encryption. The ability of Alameda to borrow funds held at FTX.com to be utilized for its own trading or investments without any effective limits whatsoever. The lack of complete documentation for transactions involving nearly 500 separate investments made with FTX Group funds and assets in the absence of audited or reliable financial statements. Customer assets at FTX.com were commingled with assets from the Alameda trading platform. Alameda used client funds to engage in margin trading, which exposed customer funds to massive losses. The FTX Group went on a spending binge in 2021, 2022. $5 billion was spent on a myriad of businesses and investments, many of which may only be worth a fraction of what was paid for them. Loans and other payments were made to insiders in excess of $1.5 billion. Mr. Bankman-Fried personally received $1 billion, a $1 billion loan from Alameda Research and could not confidently state who authorized the loan. The loans that were given to Mr. Bankman-Fried were not just one loan, it was numerous loans, some of which were documented by individual promissory notes. Uh, in one sense, in, instance, uh, he, he signed both as the issuer of the loan as well as the recipient of the loan. Did FTX have sufficient risk management systems? There were virtually no internal controls and no separateness whatsoever. What did Alameda Research do? It engaged in you know, margin trading, you know, took long and short positions in crypto. Of course, we now know also invested in over $5 billion of uh, other assets, which are in a variety of, of sectors. Was that a distinct set of capital between those two uh, companies? The answer to that is no. When approximately did FTX begin to experience financial trouble? Well, it was first disclosed uh, to the public uh, beginning around November 2nd, but this is not something that happened overnight or in the context of a week. Mr. Bankman Fried has said that he wasn't running Alameda or making decisions on the Alameda side. I, I don't know the basis for his comment. I, I will note that he owned 90% of Alameda. You've seen no distinction in governance between the two? Oh, absolutely not. There's no distinction whatsoever. You know, there's no record keeping whatsoever. It's the absence of record keeping. They use QuickBooks, a multi-billion dollar company using QuickBooks. Nothing against QuickBooks, it's a very nice tool, just not for a multi-billion dollar company. We had one person really controlling this. Uh, no independent board. That's highly unusual in a size company this is. And it's made all more complex because we're not dealing with, you know, widgets or, you know, or something that's tangible. We're dealing with, with, with crypto. This is really old fashioned and, and embezzlement. This is just taking money from customers and using it for your own purpose. Not sophisticated at all. 
uh, sophisticated perhaps in the way they were able to sort of hide it from people, frankly, right in front of their eyes. This is just plain old embezzlement. Old school. Old school. There you go. That's the testimony of the expert putting out the fires at FTX as we speak. O'Leary also participated in these hearings, and here's what the clueless wonder had to say for the record. Why do you believe FTX failed? I have an opinion. I don't have the records. Here it is. After my accounts were stripped of all of their assets and all of the accounting and trade information, I couldn't get answers from any of the executives in the firm, so I simply called Sam Bankman-Fried and said, where is the money, Sam? In my view, my personal opinion, these two behemoths that own the unregulated market together and grew these incredible businesses in terms of growth were at war with each other. And one put the other out of business intentionally. Binance is a massive, unregulated, global monopoly now. They put FTX out of business. Yeah, the reason why FTX shit itself couldn't possibly be the billion dollar personal loan that SBF took from Alameda with no repayment plan. Couldn't be the $3.1 billion in other loans given out to three other officers at FTX. Couldn't be the $5 billion spending spree they went on last year or the $300 million of real estate they bought in the Bahamas. Couldn't possibly be the fact that this little idiot couldn't trade a dollar bill for four quarters on her best day in the market, which explains her personal margin account being $1.3 billion in the hole. Couldn't be the fact that FTX was dishing out massive donations to their favorite political party hand over fist, or that they committed to a $135 million deal to put their name and logo on the Miami-Dade sports arena. No, it must be the fault of the other guy, who with a single concern that FTX couldn't cover withdrawals, collapsed the walls of FTX down around their heads. The reason why those walls collapsed is not due to what Chang Peng Zhao tweeted during his Twitter war with Bankman Freed, because as it turns out, CZ's concerns were completely justified. So when O'Leary attacked CZ, accusing him of intentionally crashing FTX to create a global monopoly in the crypto exchange space, Zhao was having none of O'Leary's nonsense and called O'Leary a liar on December 15th of 2022. He's making a bunch of nonsense claims and they don't make sense, they don't make any logic. Um, he shouldn't be making those claims as a celebrity investor. For example, in that interview with you guys, that in the same interview he said, the entire record of the, from his account on FTX, the entire records are gone. He's not concerned about that. He just picks up the phone and calls SBF. He's not concerned about the fact that the platform records for users are gone. He's not concerned about other users. How many people can pick up the phone and call SBF? And he says he was talking with SBF up until the point that he was SBF was arrested. Yeah, that, CZ, that's I see an indicator point. of a very special relationship. So he just want to talk to Sam and believe whatever Sam says. He doesn't want to look at the records. He says he didn't know that Binance was a shareholder of FTX. So he invested in FTX without looking at the cap table. So um, I think Calvin's a liar. So um, I think he's lying about, about a bunch of stuff. So that's okay, his but problem. These two men have been bickering back and forth for days now through solo interviews like a tennis match, but we have yet to see both men on the same program at the same time to yell at each other directly in real time. Something to look forward to. There's a well-known saying out there attributable to multiple authors. If something can be destroyed by the truth, it deserves to be destroyed by the truth. FTX deserved to be destroyed by the truth. The corruption and fraud of the company is already completely evident. The sad part is, naive crypto investors who trusted that FTX was, in fact, the safe and easy way to get into crypto, have also been financially destroyed. And for that, everyone involved in this massive fraud needs to be sent to prison. Now that SBF has been arrested in the Bahamas and extradited to the US, according to some reports he could be looking at 115 years behind bars on the following charges. Two counts of wire fraud, two counts of conspiracy to commit wire fraud, and one count of money laundering. And if that wasn't bad enough, he's also facing charges of conspiracy to commit commodities fraud, conspiracy to commit securities fraud, and conspiracy to defraud the United States and commit campaign finance violations. The 1% genius wonder boy has now become the industry's poster child for all the wrong reasons. And SBF's parents, the supposed compliance lawyers that Kevin O'Leary fawned over in his previous interviews, According to the new CEO of FTX, they took payments from this business. Although a dollar amount was not mentioned, yet, we already know it included a $16.4 million home in the Bahamas. What else they may have received has yet to be tallied and disclosed. 
which brings us back around to the paid brand ambassador for the exchange, who is still making the apologist tour for FTX while singing the blues about all the money he lost. We're going to float a theory here where it comes to the relationship between O'Leary and Sam Bankman-Fried. Based on what we know about the first name speed dial connection between O'Leary and Bankman-Fried, and O'Leary's past public deception when it came to crypto to cover his butt with regulators, and the fact that O'Leary is heavily involved in crypto exchanges through WonderFi slash BitBuy slash Coinberry, and the fact that O'Leary preaches about his ability to build up entrepreneurs through his business and political connections, it would stand to reason that O'Leary played much more of a role in FTX than he is presently letting on. Also, O'Leary's addiction to money is so strong it would make a tweaker uncomfortable, and Sam Bankman fried was reportedly worth 66 times what O'Leary ever was. Kevin covets wealth and Bankman Freed had it. So it would be harder to believe that O'Leary did not try to act as some sort of mentor or advisor to SPF, which may make him more complicit in the fall of the exchange than the other celebrities that simply endorsed FTX in the cameo commercials. It will be interesting to watch how all of this unravels in the court to see if O'Leary had any guiding hand in the investments and margin trading Alameda was conducting, since those losses of customer funds without their knowledge or approval caused the virtual run on the bank that shut FTX down. If O'Leary played any role in this at all, the $15 million in fees that he is out might just be the beginning of the pain he's going to feel. It's possible that O'Leary knew nothing of the monkey business behind the scenes. It's just incredibly unlikely. You are the, we're the spokesman and ambassador for this company. Yes, yes because what we... What kind of diligence did you do around this issue of compliance given where we sit well, today. I, I obviously know all the institutional investors in this deal. We, we all look like idiots. Let's put that on the table, okay? We relied on each other's due diligence, but we also relied on another investment theme that I felt drove a lot of interest in FTX. Sam Bankman fried is an American. As he said himself, he knew all the institutional investors in FTX, and they relied on each other's due diligence, which is why they all look like idiots. So we'll have to see as things unfold whether O'Leary was complicit with FTX's fraud and disastrous business model, or if he was completely incompetent in his due diligence before coming on board as a shareholder and brand ambassador. Either way, it is not going to be a wonderful look for him. Now, as we mentioned for this segment, we had to pick a cutoff date and produce the segment with what we had at the time. Since then, obviously, events have occurred that warrant an update. Of the greatest significance is the fact that Sam Bankman fried appeared in U.S. District Court in New York and pleaded not guilty on each of the charges against him. Those eight charges are still the same as what we outlined earlier, but as the investigation continues, more charges may be added. SBF is currently out on bail, in his parents' custody, at their home, with his criminal trial set to begin on October 2nd of 2023. Caroline Ellison, CEO at Alameda, decided to take the other route on December 21st by surrendering herself into a plea deal that may help her avoid over a century in prison. She is apparently now cooperating with authorities as they try to make heads or tails out of the total scope of this investigation. If Ellison cooperates fully, the only charges she will face so far as the South District of New York is concerned are criminal tax violations. However, the deal does not guarantee other agencies won't take actions against her. Ellison also needed to put up a quarter million dollar bond and surrender her travel documents to remain in the U.S. in the meantime. To clarify, this plea agreement has not yet been agreed to by the court. On the same day, December 21st, Gary Wang, co-founder of FTX and the chief technical officer, also pleaded guilty to the charges leveled against him, four counts of wire fraud and wire fraud conspiracy, as well as conspiracy to commit commodities and securities fraud. Having pleaded guilty, Wang will be sentenced at a later date and could still face 50 years in prison plus fines. It depends on how the judge rules. As you can expect, we will be keeping an eye out for when this trial begins and as the investigations continue, especially if Kevin O'Leary's name pops up again. What we need to take away from O'Leary in general is that despite his public image and reported amassed wealth, he is certainly not someone people should be taking advice from especially when he's pitching expensive watches as an investment option or telling people to accumulate meta stock because he called the bottom on it at 232 last year. At the end of the day, Mr. Wonderful has benefited tremendously from a false image spread across multiple platforms, across multiple TV shows, each of them implying that the deal he made with Mattel netted him around $4 billion. But as we know now, his proceeds from that deal were far less than billionaire level 
He made about 5.9 million in stock, the majority of which he sold off prior to the true financial condition of the company becoming known, which should have qualified as insider trading, and the 5.2 he was handed when he was given the boot from Mattel. People think that because they recognize him from the TV, that O'Leary is somebody smarter than them, that they need to listen to, and that is not the case. Kevin O'Leary is just another rich prick who failed upwards, banked on the success of others, and wrote coattails to where he is today. So his inspirational quote ripoffs, his investment advice videos, his vanity YouTube channel, and the books he flogs would only really be of interest to someone who, like him, has no scruples about screwing over every business partner they've ever had, likes pretending they're something they're not, and just so happened to have a fully loaded bank of mom in the beginning to get the ball rolling downhill after she paid for him to graduate university twice. If you think this guy, who bombed every question in Celebrity Jeopardy, Kevin, what is Liechtenstein? Nope. What is a wing? Nope. What is carbon aging? Nope. What is Pluto? No. What is New Jersey? Oh, no. That won't do it for you. You lose everything. You drop to zero. Let's You're a go. bad man, Alex. I know. Is the genius to guide you through the world of entrepreneurship, business, or finance? Listen to how this article summarized his performance, because it perfectly describes Kevin O'Leary. This universe is not always a fair place. The rich and pompous often go far, while the smart and humble are stymied. But sometimes the universe plays equalizer, and sometimes Celebrity Jeopardy acts as its instrument. So when you watch Money Court this week, and you see Kevin O'Leary rule with assumed wisdom, just remember that this is a guy who thinks New Jersey is a city. It'll improve your day. And that, dear listeners, is the cold hard truth about Kevin O'Leary. If you don't think so, if you still think he's a business genius, an entrepreneurial guru, and deserving of the nickname Mr. Wonderful, you don't know Jack! Thank you for tuning in to this final episode of the Common Sense Skeptic for 2022, even though it was a few days late. Part one of this series has already been very well received as one of our top rated episodes of all time, and hopefully this series has opened a few eyes. There's nothing better for us than going through the comments after the video releases and finding the people who learn something from the videos we produce. That really is the whole point of this channel, to open your eyes and get your brain working so that the next time someone comes across as too good to be true, you'll instinctively know to start digging into them. We have a lot of material in the pipeline to present in the next few months, with some episodes that people have been patiently waiting for. If you'd like to support our future productions directly, please visit our page at patreon.com, The Common Sense Skeptic. The other ways that you can support this channel right now, leave the video a thumbs up, share it with the people you know, subscribe to the channel, and ring that notification bell so that you'll know when The Common Sense Skeptic returns. 